Hi everyone, thank you for joining me. My name is Kathleen Van Dyke. I am a postdoctoral fellow in geriatric psychology. I'm here to speak with you today about getting help with caregiving, both in-home help and residential placement. This is a particularly important topic for caregivers of individuals with dementia. While you're viewing today's webinar, feel free to tweet in questions on Twitter using the hashtag UCLAMDChat. And I'll be answering some of these questions at the end of the webinar. First, let's talk about some caregiving statistics. We know that 15 million Americans serve in the role of unpaid caregiver for a person with Alzheimer's disease or another type of dementia. 80% of this care at home is done by a family member. We know that over half of caregivers are over the age of 55, raising the likelihood that they may be facing some health-related issues uh, due to aging themselves. We also know that a substantial portion of Americans are long-distance caregivers, living a few hours away. So perhaps they're not able to manage the day-to-day -day needs of the person with dementia. The role of the caregiver for an older adult with dementia is much greater than the role of the caregiver for an older adult without dementia. Here we're looking at the proportion of caregivers who assist with various types of day-to-day -day tasks. The blue bars represent caregivers for individuals with dementia. The green bars represent caregivers for individuals without dementia. As you can see, caregivers for people with dementia assist with more daily activities than those for older adults who do not have dementia. Things like getting in and out of bed, dressing, getting to and from the bathroom, bathing, managing incontinence and diapers, and feeding. Caregiving can also have a significant, significant impact on the caregiver's ability to work. So 54% of caregivers have reported that due to their caregiving responsibilities, they had to go in late or leave early or take some time off from work. 15% of caregivers reported that they actually had to take a leave of absence because their responsibilities were so great. So this raises the important issue that caregiving can have an impact on the family's income. Caregiving can involve both emotional costs as well as physical costs. 60% of caregivers report high emotional stress due to caregiving. A third of caregivers report symptoms consistent with depression. We know that caregivers may experience some physical decline as well. Care the caregiver's health may become secondary to the health of the individual who has dementia. Caregivers can experience decline in health. They can have increased physical stress, increased risk for cardiovascular disease, and reduced immune function, leading to increased risk for developing diseases and infections. Because of the high burden of caregiving, most individuals who are caregivers for people with dementia will need to ask for help at some point. Some people need to ask for help in the early stages of dementia. Some people ask for help in the later stages of dementia. It is important to ask for help whenever you need it. The nature of Alzheimer's disease and other progressive dementias is that the symptoms of dementia will progress over time. The person with dementia will need more and more assistance with day-to-day -day activities. So sometimes there are also safety concerns. Perhaps the caregiver can't watch their, their loved one for 24 hours a day to make sure that they don't accidentally harm themselves. There may be caregiving responsibilities that involve lifting the person for dressing or bathing that the caregiver just can't manage on their own. So because of this, caregivers will need to ask for help. 
Some people think that asking for help shows lack of caring or weakness, but the opposite is true. Asking for help shows strength. Asking for help shows that the caregiver understands their limitations and knows when it's time to seek support. There are different options for getting additional help with caregiving. Some people may be able to keep their loved one at home with assistance from family and from paid caregivers, either through an agency or an individual provider. For some people, moving the individual with dementia to a residence is the best option for them. So there are different types of facilities and these vary by the needs of the individual and the amount of care that they provide. Assisted living facilities involve minimal care with day-to-day -day tasks like shopping and cleaning. Assisted living residences can uh, range from larger institutions to small group homes that have fewer residents and simulate life at home. Nursing homes or skilled nursing facilities provide medical needs and can assist with more day-to-day -day activities for the person. There may be Alzheimer's special care units in a nursing home that are uh, units specifically designed for caring for an individual with dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Continuing care retirement communities are facilities that have different tiers of care. So the individual, uh, if the individual needs a higher level of care, they may be able to move within the same facility to a different unit. In some cases, caregivers may need additional support for a specific period of time. Perhaps uh, they are going on vacation for a few weeks, or perhaps they are undergoing surgery and need to, need to spend a few weeks in recovery. In these types of situations, respite care is available. Respite care is support for a specific period of time. It can either be in-home paid support or it can mean temporarily, temporarily moving your loved one with dementia to a facility, but it typically involves an endpoint. First, let's talk about getting help in the home. <clears throat> Here are some common types of in-home services available. Companion services help with supervising the individual, going for walks, doing recreational activities, Homemaker services help with things like housekeeping, shopping, meal preparation. Personal care services can help with things like bathing, dressing, using the toilet, or exercising or other types of personal care. Skilled care is typically done by a licensed health professional and can involve things like wound care, injections, physical therapy, other types of more medical tasks. Studies have shown that families who obtained care in the home were able to delay the move to a facility longer than families who did not obtain in-home help and needed to turn to institutionalization sooner. There are different resources available for finding in-home in care, and here are some. First, you might want to ask the uh, person's doctor or other healthcare professional for referrals. Chances are, if they work with older adults with dementia, they've dealt with uh, others who are also looking for in-home care and may be able to provide you with some referrals and recommendations. The Medicare website offers um, a search engine for looking for in-home care in your area. The Alzheimer's Association Community Resource Finder is also a good place to look for in-home care that might be in your, in your area. The Elder Care Locator run by the National Institute on Aging is another resource. You can call their 800 number on the screen or you can go to eldercare.gov. Finally, you may also want to ask friends, family, neighbors, others who may have gone through obtaining in-home care and ask about their experiences and see if they have any recommendations for you. 
Before obtaining or hiring in-home care, it's important to get as much information as possible as you can. So first, ask for references um, and follow up on those references. Check with the Better Business Bureau in your area. See if there have been any complaints filed against the agency. It'll be important to create a list of care needs so that when you sit down with the person that you're intending to work with, that the list that you have of the needs you need fulfilled match what they're able to provide for you. If possible, interview the person that you're thinking of hiring with another person that you trust to get another person's in perspective of whether or not they'll be a good, a good fit. If you're thinking of hiring an in-home care agency, here are some questions that you might want to think about asking when you meet with them. Will the same helper come each time? Not all agencies send the same helper, and so it'll be important for you to know if you'll be working with the same person or if you'll need to prepare for different people coming on different days. You'll also want to get a breakdown of the cost of their services. In-home care agencies typically charge by the hour, and Medicare and insurance plans may cover some, but not all of the costs associated with in-home care. And so it'll be important for you to know what payments you'll be responsible for. Ask what is specifically included and what is not included in their services so that you have an understanding of if it's a good fit. You also want to ask, how does the agency check the background and experience of their helpers? How do they train them? Are they trained in dementia care? Do they have training in CPR? How do they handle uh, problems? Who do you call if there is a problem? If you're thinking about hiring an independent provider to provide in-home care, here are some questions that you might want to think about. Ask them if they have experience working with someone with dementia. Have they been trained in dementia care? Again, have your list of needs ready and ask if they'll be able to meet those health and behavioral needs. Ask them if they're trained in first aid and in CPR. Ask them if they're bonded. Being bonded is like a type of insurance which can protect um, your loved one from potential losses like a broken washing machine. Ask them if they're able to provide references and follow up on those references. Also ask if they get sick, are they able to provide backup? There are some steps that you can take to prepare for in-home care. You'll want the person coming into your loved one's home to have some knowledge about them. Provide them with written information about your loved one's abilities. Maybe they're able to call their daughter in the afternoon, but maybe they won't remember that they did so a few hours later. Provide the new helper with a list of the individual's likes and dislikes. Maybe they like watching old movies in the afternoon, but they don't like watching the news. Let them know what your loved one's food preferences are. And this can be important for preventing disagreements or difficulties around mealtimes. The Alzheimer's Association provides a list of personal uh, facts that you can download from this website, which might be helpful in organizing some of the information that you can provide your new helper. Introducing a new helper into your loved one's home may not necessarily go smoothly at first. There are some steps that you can take to help ease this introduction. You'll want to spend time with both the new helper and your loved one with dementia. Sit down, engage in small talk, help the, your loved one get to know the helper, show your loved one that you trust this new helper and that you accept them into the home. In-home care is not always the best option for families. Sometimes they need to turn to residential placement. Residential placement is often a very difficult decision for families to make. 
but sometimes it's very necessary. Dementia is the most common reason for placement of an older adult in a residential facility. Studies have found that 20% of individuals diagnosed with a dementia are moved to a residency about a year after the diagnosis. 50% move after five years. And 90% of individuals living with dementia move after eight years. Moving to a residential facility is more common among those with severe dementia than with more mild dementia, likely because the caregiver burden is greater for those with more severe symptoms of dementia. When polled, a majority, 77% of families agreed that there is no right or no wrong when it comes time to the to, to uh, for when it comes to the decision to place. So the decision to place a loved one in a residential facility is very personal and very specific to the family situation. It should evolve from careful considerations of the needs and abilities of the person with dementia and the needs and abilities of the caregiver who is caring for them. There are different types of residential facilities and deciding on a facility will depend upon the needs of the person with dementia. Assisted living facilities are typically more appropriate for individuals with mild dementia, those who are more independent and resistant to care. Assisted living facilities will provide some assistance with things like cleaning, shopping, cooking, uh, but there are typically less staff per resident than a nursing home. Also, it's important to keep in mind that if an individual with dementia lives in a, an assisted living facility, there may come a time where the dementia progresses or there is other physical decline and that person may need to move to another facility that offers a higher level of care. Nursing homes or skilled nursing facilities are typically more appropriate for people with moderate to severe symptoms of dementia. Nursing homes can meet medical needs and involve trained nursing staff. There are more, there's more staff per resident in nursing homes and they're typically more appropriate also for those who are bed bound. It's important to plan ahead when making the decision to move an individual to a residential facility. Your first or even second choice may not always have a bed or an apartment available, and you may need to put your name on a wait list. Even if this is not a decision that you're planning to make right now, if it seems like it's something that might be down the road for you, it's important to start thinking about and investigating your options. It can make a difference if your loved one is transitioned to a residential facility from home or if they're hospitalized for some reason and they're transitioned from the hospital. If they're transitioned from the hospital, a hospital social worker will typically help to find a residence that has availability. Your, the time that you're given to make the decision and your options may be limited. But if you plan ahead, you may be able to accept admission in the residence that has availability, but also keep your name on a wait list for a residence that you prefer. Several factors go into the decision to move an individual to a residential facility the caregiver's physical health and functioning can contribute to this decision. Studies have found that caregivers were more likely to decide to move their loved one to a facility if they rated their own health as much worse than it was the year before. The emotional toll and psychological toll of caregiving is also an important factor that can contribute to the decision to move a loved one to a residence. Increased behavioral problems that maybe the caregiver isn't able to manage on their own can contribute to the decision to place. Finally, financial hardship, 
related to reduced income or to the increased costs of care can also contribute to placement. Again, the decision to move a loved one to a residential facility is highly personal and specific to the family's needs and situations, but moving an individual to a facility that has staff and is equipped to manage the needs of the person with dementia can help to alleviate some caregiver burden. Try to involve your loved one in the selection of the facility. Take tours with them. Eat lunch with them at the facility. Try to elicit their opinion about whether or not they'll be comfortable in the facility. It may be the case that family members do not all agree on the decision to move a loved one to a residential facility. In these situations, it can be helpful to hold a family meeting where everyone has the opportunity to discuss how they feel about the situation and their concerns. You may want to include trusted providers like the individual's doctor or a social worker or geriatric care manager or other professional in the meeting. These providers can help to provide information and also may be able to help with some of the logistics of moving your loved one to a residential facility. Here are some national resources that you can use to find a licensed residence in your area. Medicare's Nursing Home Compare website can help you find nursing homes that are certified by Medicare at this website. The Elder Care Locator is also a good resource that can help answer questions about transitioning your loved one and finding a residence in your area. The Alzheimer's Association Senior Housing Finder provides various filters that can help you select appropriate services in your area. And finally, the Alzheimer's Foundation of America provides names and links and information for dementia care settings that meet its national standards. There are essentially four main considerations when thinking about moving your loved one to a residence. You'll want to think about the quality of care at the residence and your loved one's medical needs, the fees and costs associated with moving and with uh, placing your loved one in a residence. You'll want to think about the quality of life for the person with dementia and also the quality of life for the family and the caregiver. There are several resources out there for providing information about uh, this decision. Some of them are at uh, the National Institute on Aging website, the Medicare website, the Alzheimer's Association, and caregiving books such as the 36-hour day can be very helpful in providing information um, and resources about this decision. First, here are some questions that, uh, in term, that you might want to think about in terms of the quality of care and medical needs. Does the level of care offered at the facility meet the needs of your loved one with dementia? What kind of state or industry certification does the facility have? States like the state of California have regulations about the quality of care for residences for older adults. Ask how often it's inspected. Ask if you can view the report. Ask if there's ever a reason that your loved one would be asked to leave the facility. Would they be asked to leave for behavioral problems or for dementia? Ask them if there's a physician on call. What happens in the case of a medical emergency? Is there transportation available for doctor's appointments and other types of appointments? Are there services available within the facility itself for things like dental care, vision, hearing? If so, who pays for them? Does the facility have policies on terminal care? This is an important but often difficult question to ask. Some nursing homes have policies on life-sustaining measures and it's important to ask what they are and have the wishes of the individual with 
dementia and the family documented in the person's chart. There are typically different sources of funding that go into paying for care. Often the person with dementia's own income, such as a pension or Social Security, will need to be spent for paying for a facility. Family may be able to help pay for some of the costs. Long-term care insurance may be able to help pay for some of the costs as well, but it's important to read the policy very carefully. Medicare typically provides coverage for short nursing home stays, but they may be able to help defray some of the services associated with the care received at the facility. When an individual has no other sources of support, Medicaid and Medi-Cal in California can help cover nursing home expenses. If the person is a veteran, Veteran Affairs Medical Centers often have long-term care services, nursing home services, respite services, sometimes adult daycare services, but these vary depending on the VA, so it'll be important to contact the VA in your area. Some residences that aren't VAs also offer discounts for uh, veterans, so ask about that when you visit. Be sure to get a written breakdown of all of the fees associated with the residents. Ask if there's an entrance fee. Ask if there's a monthly fee. Ask specifically what services and activities are included in the monthly fee. Does the residence accept Medicare? Does the residence accept Medicaid? Here are some questions to think about in regards to the quality of life of the loved one with dementia. When you visit a facility, notice the grounds. Does it appear clean and well kept? Is the facility pleasant? Does it feel homey? Do apartments or rooms all have windows? Notice the residents of the facility. Do they appear well cared for? If you're in a nursing home, do you see residents sitting in the hall by themselves? Notice how staff interact with the residents. Are, are they prompt with requests? Do they talk to the, the resident while they're helping them? Are there social activities at the facility that your loved one can engage in? Is there a recreational therapist? Um, are there special activities specifically for people who have memory problems and dementia? With regards to meals, does the person have the ability to choose their own meals? Is the food appetizing? How are special diet needs accommodated? Here are some questions to think about um, in terms of the quality of life for the family and the caregiver. Think about, is the facility close enough to visit? Is it easy to visit? How is visitation managed? Can you visit whenever you'd like to? Are there care planning meetings? If so, how often do they occur? What is the role of the family in the residence? Is there a family council that you can become involved with? There are some steps that you can take to help transition your loved one to a residential care facility. First, you'll want to help the staff get to know the individual. Provide them with written information about your loved one with dementia. What are their food preferences? What do they like? What don't they like? What types of things might agitate or irritate them? Let them know what their interests are. What type of types of music or movies do they like? Do they like to go for walks? Do they enjoy painting? Let them know what abilities the person has and what they might also need some help with. Do they need help getting dressed or brushing their teeth? Do they have trouble communicating their, their needs? Also be important to let them know important personal information about the individual. What was their occupation? What are the names of some important family members in their lives? 
you'll need to work with staff to determine how often it's most helpful to visit. Try to work with staff to discuss during the period of transition what is the most helpful visitation schedule while your loved one adjusts to their new living situation. Provide your loved one with a scrapbook um, that contains memories, pictures, um, information from childhood and pictures of family members, things that are familiar and comforting for them. It is important to know that it will take time for your loved one to adjust to their new living arrangement. And this can mean weeks or even months. This is often a particularly difficult time for family members, so it's helpful to be prepared for a potentially lengthy period of adjustment. A common phrase heard from individuals who have dementia and are placed in a residential care facility is, I want to go home. This sentiment usually reflects feelings of insecurity or fear. And it may not mean that the individual wants to move back to their prior living arrangement, but may just reflect that they would like things around them that are familiar to them. If this is the situation, here are some tips to help manage this. First, don't disagree with the person or try to reason with them. This is typically not a helpful conversation for either the person with dementia or their family. Instead, try to understand and acknowledge their feelings and reassure them that they will be safe. Touching and hugging and holding can be very reassuring. Reminisce with them about their childhood, about happy family mem memories. Finally, Try, you can also try to redirect them with food that they like or with other activities such as taking a, a nice walk. After moving a loved one with dementia to a residential care facility, the role of the caregiver is far from over. Caregivers continue to assist with financial and legal matters. They continue to help coordinate medical care. Uh, they also provide emotional support for their loved one. After placement, the caregiver may experience some stress. And studies have found that caregivers who visited and were continued, continued to be involved in providing care for their loved one had less stress after moving their, the individual. Try to make your visits as enjoyable as possible. Develop new traditions or rituals um, to engage with, with your loved one. Maybe it's reading the newspaper together or opening mail together, painting their nails or brushing their hair. Um, if possible, go for a walk or take a drive and get some tea. After moving a loved one with dementia to an, a residential facility, caregivers often experience mixed emotions. There is typically a period of immediate relief, likely because perhaps some of the overwhelming aspects of caregiving are no longer their responsibility. But over time, it is not uncommon for caregivers to experience feelings of loss, anxiety, feelings of depression, or feelings of guilt. Seek support if you start to notice these feelings or if they start to become overwhelming. Counseling or caregiver support groups can be helpful to discuss your feelings with others who may have been through similar circumstances. The good news is that studies have found that these negative feelings tend to get better over time. So while the move of the loved one to a residential facility may be associated with some negative feelings, they tend to abate likely with increased acceptance that the decision to move the loved one with dementia to a residential care facility was likely the best decision for both the person with dementia as well as the caregiver caring for them. Thank you very much for joining me today. Um, this is my 
email address if you have any questions. I'll also be answering some questions that have been tweeted over the course of the webinar. Okay, so one of the questions that we've received is, what is the difference between assisted living and skilled nursing? So assisted living facilities typically are appropriate for those who are able to do most of their day-to-day -day tasks. Assisted living doesn't typically help with complex medical needs, and they, they may help with some cleaning or cooking, things like that, but they're, they often don't provide the level of supervision or support that a skilled nursing facility would be able to. Skilled nursing facilities offer more staff per resident and can help address any complex medical needs that the person might have. Okay, we have another question. Um, my husband and I would like to go on vacation for a couple of weeks, but we are the primary caregiver for my mother. What can we do for short-term care? So for a situation such as these, respite care is an option for those who might need some additional support for a length of time. So going on vacation um, is a, a good example. You may be able to hire in-home help for a short period of time, or you may be able to temporarily move your loved one, or your mother in this case, to a residence um, while you're away. Here's another question. Is it better to hire a male or a female in-home helper? Um, this is a question that, that can come up. So when thinking about the gender of the helper in the home, uh, you'll want to think about what are the preferences of your loved one with dementia, who, who they'll be working with. And you'll also want to think about what types of help, what types of activities will you be asking the helper to assist your loved one with? Okay. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I hope that this was informative for you.